don't mind me. Um, it depends on where I am. You know, your mind can be somewhere, your body is in another location. When you travel across the world, you move across different time zones. I mean, for me, it's morning. Amen. It's good to be here this evening with you. And I hope that you have not recovered from Sunday service. There's no, shouldn't recover from that. That was a profound service in every way. I followed the message, and um, I think when the ministration started, I couldn't connect with the broadcast anymore. Um, great service. You know, a word from God settles all things. It, put fuel, it puts fuel in your engine, causes you to run, to have hope, and to just keep doing the things that um, he's asked you to do. One of the things about receiving a prophetic word, I was telling my children, because they were sharing with me <laughs> the word they received, and I said to them, from experience, write it down. That's what the book of Habakkuk says. Um, so that you can run with it when it's plainly written. Over time, I found out that the things that God speaks to our lives, um, even if they make sense at that moment, it will make more sense when we look at it in retrospect. Because the way we stumble into the fullness of God's will often is not, um, how do you put it? It's, it's not... Um, the way we expect or predetermined from our own minds. Saul was minding his father's business when he was anointed to be king. When he left home that morning, being king wasn't on his mind. What was on his mind were his father's asses. But he would have a collusion with destiny when he met a prophet who began to speak to him. David was minding his own business when he went to go meet his brothers and he, there he saw Goliath contending you know, with the armies of God. And that was the beginning of something prophetic in his life. And that's the way it is with us that very often we sometimes walk consciously into God's will. Other times we stumble upon it. But whether it's consciously or unconsciously, the most important thing is that we will be in his will. You know, I'm, I'm so confident in God that he will bring us to that place he wants us to be, whether we like it or not. Amen. Can I get an amen if you still got people here with me today? Great. So it's, it's really exciting to be back um, here and to know that it's been such a great time um, together, just enjoying God's presence. That was a long service, you know. There's some things people will wait for. Other times, they'll be checking their watches to see what is being said. I want to read to you a scripture this evening before I introduce our minister tonight to us. You know, I still have a message that is unfinished. It will come. Keep it in your shelf. Then intermittent breaks. All right. It's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Just, well, somebody just needs to keep tabs with me so I don't end up. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as their children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. 
My consideration, just for a few minutes, is on the word imitators. Most of you have heard of the word imitation. Okay? From a negative perspective, an imitation simply is a copy of the original. It looks like the original. And if you trust the Chinese, they are so good at copies that even the fabricators of the original get confused when they see the copy. I mean, they're, they're so, so good at it. And you can imagine what it will be like in the next 20 years when they develop skill and literally copying the original. You know, you can so copy the original that the original will become fake. <laughs> you just enhance so many things, you know, about it. But that word, um, for anyone who is a follower of God and a follower of Christ, is a very powerful word. What it simply means is that you mimic. The word imitator actually is in the Greek mimitis, which simply means that you deliberately mimic. You deliberately copy in order to upgrade yourself. For those of you who have children, it is common that at certain ages your children would want to I mean I think every child does this they will wear your shoes they just your shoes are there and they're just going to put their feet in it and they will try to walk like you and as they get older they're going to try and talk like you they just mimic you now it is through mimicry that we grow and develop to become men and women of our own one of the things, um, and I say many things, is that if you do not learn to be imitators of people who have succeeded in certain fields of endeavor or in certain areas of their lives, uh, becoming great will become a challenge for you. I've often shared this that when I began to minister the word of God, what I literally did was to cram messages. I would take a tape. I would cram it. And many of the people I listened to were prophetic. So they would prophesy in the middle. And I would prophesy the same prophecy. <laughs> and you know you can mimic tongues as well. Yes. I was trying to mimic Pastor Ayo. I said, let me leave him. <laughs> Everybody prays in a particular way. And we have, you know, our own expressions there. And that's exactly what I did. And the Spirit of God will move in. Even though I was copying someone else. But I've come to a point now where I really don't have to copy anymore. Because I've also become an original that needs to be copied. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that's how life goes. And then someone else who's copying me becomes an original who also needs to be copied. But it's a principle of spiritual growth and it's a principle of advancement. It's a powerful kingdom principle that we've got to learn about. The question that I ask myself constantly, and on a day like this, is that as pastor over an assembly, how many people are seeing things in me that they can mimic? You know, it's a, it's a very critical question. How many people see something and say, mm, let's catch on to this? How many people can catch on to something that's embedded within my message that may not be spelled black and white, but it's, it's, it's an expression. It's, a, it's, it's an attitude towards life. The lazy man turns upon his bed like the hinges of a door and he says there is a lion in the streets. So, what are you learning? 
As we come here every Wednesday to be mentored, but mentoring is beyond the words that are said. The book of Hebrews says, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So when people are achieving certain things or making progress in their lives, the question you should be asking is, what is the key? What are they doing? And if you can imitate them, you will make significant progress in your own lives too. The worst thing that can ever happen to you is to come to a place where you believe that you want to be an original without being an imitator from the beginning and therefore you lose out completely on the grace that can pass on to you from other people. I learn every day. And I also impart to people that are in touch with me at any particular point. One of the things I've learned is freely have I received, freely do I give. I like to teach people, I like to instruct them, I like to show them how I've succeeded, I like to tell them where I failed so that they can learn both from my successes and from my failures and so that they would minimize their failures and maximize their successes. Sometimes people think, I think particularly in Lighthouse, think pastor complains too much. You know, when Judah is ministering, they're looking at my face. True or false? True? I've heard Judah, you know, lead worship leaders say, I feel more comfortable when pastor is not in church and I'm leading worship <laughs> to when he's there. Some, some feel like that. I have a standard. And I will not compromise it. So you also need to catch on to that standard. And also raise the bar for yourself. Are you getting what I'm saying? Until you raise that bar, you will just think, he just likes to talk. Um, he's always seeing something that's not... Do you, do you get what I'm saying? That's what a father does, really. is, is to teach and instruct you. Every song they sing, I know it. I know the original. So when they sing it, it doesn't sound like the original. Something in me just says, eh. It's, it's reflex. Because it's not the I I know it. I, I know every inflection and every chord progression and all of those things. And many times when Robert is on the keyboard and the, sometimes you know the choir is singing and they're not on the same key. Everybody in church is enjoying worship. I am there saying to myself, oh God, <laughs> help the choir. The spirit of intercession comes upon me. And it's not bad. Because without standards, everybody will set his own rule. And there will be total confusion. So say to somebody, who are you mimicking? It's got to be someone. Tonight I have in the house, one of us in the house. Some of you are acquainted with her person, others are not. I have asked her to share today because... For so many reasons, I believe that she has a lot to deliver to us. She's a woman who you need to know because five years from now, you may want to know her, but she'll be too far away. As coded language. Um, she's worked at... the closest level with the former Minister of Communications. No, it's not communications. ICT. I uh, hope I get that right in this country. She is extremely learned. Um, number of her degrees. She has a PhD 
and it's not the one you get from University of <laughs> Toronto <laughs> or Chicago <laughs> or <laughs> you can fill in the gaps yourself. I won't call the one I'm referring to in my mind. But honestly, every time I've sat down with her, and we occasionally, you know, I have her come into the office a couple of times, and I ask her questions about, you know, some sectors of Nigeria, particularly relating to the ICT. I remember once she was in my office, and she was telling me about NIPOST and the possibilities there, and she spent over an hour educating me. I learn, when I tell you I sit to learn, you better believe me educating me. I sat down in my office today. I had a young man um, called Bamindeli and I said, look, you need to teach me some things. And he was with me for 45 minutes and he was teaching me, you know, about, you know, the, the mortgage finance sector of the economy. And it's not because I'm a novice there. Well, that's his area of proficiency. He said, I need to learn a couple of things. So let's talk. And I was taking notes. That's how I am. Uh, when you humble yourself to learn, you will stand in some places and you will speak and you will confound the wisest of men. I had a meeting yesterday where I had top echelons of a particular um, sector of the Nigerian um, armed forces and I confounded every one of them. I was done, they had nothing to say. They said, we need your help. And all of that was because of a question. What is a pastor doing <laughs> in construction? That's the worst question you can ask me. <laughs> because you set me on fire with that kind of question. That we need your help. You know more than us. That's because I learn. Humble myself to learn. Anyway, I just give you that for free. She's going places. I don't know how much longer she will be with us. Uh, she's walking where kings and princes tread and where mere men are afraid to tread. Let's receive tonight our sister Abiodun Jagun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm hoping my slides are, sorry, can we sit down? <laughs> I'm hoping my slides work. Um, thank you very, very, very much. It's such an honor and uh, a pleasure to at least be able to share on a few things around preparing yourself for the ideal opportunity. Um, I'm gonna be reading a lot from the notes that I've prepared and uh, Fantastic. It said that man is a creature of habit, and that leads him to become accustomed or used to things happening in a particular way. And when they don't, <laughs> he becomes uncomfortable and has to adjust, and this can take time. However, if he is told ahead of time that things will be different, he is able to adjust and adapt better and quicker. I'm saying this because of the approach I hope to take in this evening's discussion. I may not appear to be as spontaneous as you are perhaps used to. I will, for the most part, read from the pieces of paper in front of me, and I will use slides to emphasize or reinforce the points I hope to make. My prayer is that you will not be distracted by my approach. 
I choose it to ensure that I keep to time and I keep to the point and that I cover the things that I have to say within the time I am given and with enough time at the end for us to discuss further through questions and comments. With that said, permit me to use these words of a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are always with us. We know that, you are always, that your ways are higher than we can comprehend and that your thoughts are deep. We ask that you suspend whatever prejudices we have that will hinder the truth that you would have us know this evening. Amen. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the truth. Still our hearts, let your voice be all we hear. Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. When I first heard the title or subject of today's mentoring session, Preparing Yourself for the Ideal Opportunity, this quote by the Roman philosopher Seneca came to mind. Uh, the next slide, please. Sorry? Yeah. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So the question is, how can we be prepared? I began to compile a list of books that I had heard, although rarely read, that contained tips for achieving a state of preparedness. From Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People to Rick Warner's Purpose Driven Life, there's a website called goodreads.com and it allows you to keep track of books that you have read to discuss them and discover new ones. On it, you can find lists of self-help or self-motivation books that have been voted as the greatest of all time. So I added some of them, the ones with the catchiest title to my list. There's one called You Can Nail It. There's one called The Success Principles. How to get from where you are to where you want to be. My book list grew and I soon realized that I didn't have enough time to summarize them all. So I did a search for short articles and blogs on the internet. I found six tips, 20 ways, in fact, make that three ways to prepare yourself for the future. That was when I stopped. It dawned on me that the logical conclusion of this approach of understanding how to prepare for opportunity would be an extreme one. One that would lead us to believe that people, as it's shown on the screen, make their own luck in the world. And from my own little experience, I knew that this was not the case. Please don't get me wrong, there is certainly a case and a place for working to prepare yourself, but I am convinced our working is only part of the story, and that a key, and please note, I'm saying a key, not the key, to knowing how to prepare lies in understanding opportunity. So let us look more closely at our understanding via a quiz. Let us ask ourselves the question, which opportunity was Joseph preparing for? Or which opportunity was Joseph prepared for? I want us all to have at least one answer in our minds. So one answer is the opportunity to show himself as a masterful administrator. Next slide. Guru doesn't even begin to describe the knowledge and skill Joseph had in managing resources. Uh, sorry. The one before. Yeah. The Bible states in Genesis 39 that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. That God caused all that he did to prosper and allowed him to find favor in the sight of first Potiphar, then the keeper of the prisons, and then Pharaoh himself. The Bible also tells us something J Joseph did in Genesis 39.4. And because I would like my slide to stay up on the screen, permit me to read it out, and I'll be using the New King James Version. Verse 4 says, So Joseph found favor in his, and that's Potiphar's sight, and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Joseph served Potiphar trusted, God blessed. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we are told in verse 6 that Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. 
We know what happens next. In spite of Joseph's faithfulness to Potiphar, he is lied against, he's falsely accused, and he's put in jail. And we see a reinforcement of the cycle. God was with Joseph, showed him mercy, and caused him to find favor in the sight of the keeper of the prisons. The end of Genesis 39 verse 22 says, whatever the prisoners did was Joseph's doing. So again, we can say Joseph served, the keeper of the prison trusted, and God blessed. It is again the same pattern with Pharaoh. He set Joseph over all the land of Egypt. Joseph served. I ask that you read Genesis 41, 46 to, uh, Genesis 41, 46 to 49 for just a glimpse of the extent of his work. And let me explain that. It says that Joseph became the prime minister at the age of 30. And for seven years where there was plenty, he went over the whole of the realm of Egypt, gathering gain, grain. Joseph served. Pharaoh trusted. When the years of famine began and the Egyptians cried to Pharaoh for food, his response to them was Genesis 41:55. Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. Joseph served. Pharaoh trusted. God blessed. Another answer to the question, which opportunity was Joseph prepared for, could be the opportunity to show himself as the dreamer vindicated. The Bible tells us that twice he spoke of dreams in which, his, in which first his siblings and then his parents, as well as his siblings, paid homage to him. In Genesis 37, 7, Joseph told his brothers, Indeed, my sheaves stood all around, your sheaves stood all around and bowed to my sheaf. In Genesis 37, 10, Jacob, his father, asks him, Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow, uh, to bow down to the earth before you? The Bible also shows us instance, instances of these dreams being fulfilled. In Genesis 42, 6, we are told that Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. On another occasion, in Genesis 43, 26, they again bowed down before him to the earth. And in verse 28, they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. But there is yet another answer to our question. And this answer comes from Joseph himself. He had a revelation that God prepared him for the opportunity to be a preserver of life. There must have been a point in his time when Joseph recalled his dreams as a young boy and blessed as he was with wisdom to ask God for the interpretation of other people's dreams, he came to know that his life opportunity was more than a display of excellence in the affairs of men, that it was more than the opportunity to receive the ob ob obeisance of men, the, the honor of men. Hear him speak in Genesis 45 verse Verse 5, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. There will be opportunities you can prepare for. Those that reflect the world's standards, such as exams. There will be those that we can dream of, that can be contained within our imagination. But what of those God-assigned purposes? Those, to me, are the ideal opportunity. I cannot lie. Thinking of ways in which we prepare for this ideal has been a challenge. <laughs> and as such, I would like to put forward just three things that, from my limited experience, I believe are critical. I invite us all to examine them in light of our own experiences. The three things that I'm going to, focus, um, that I'm going to talk about are focus, discernment, and persistence. Let me start with focus. As a child, I was what Yoruba people call an olodo. So <laughs> that I have a PhD is a surprise. <laughs> my academic successes were so few that, when, that they are ingrained in my memory. For example, I remember that in nursery school, I came first in class just once. And I recall that the teacher carried me on his shoulders. And then it was all downhill from there. If we were 30 in the class, my position would be amongst the low 20s. 
After school lessons must have helped because I did better in primary school, but getting placed in the top 10 of the class was for me an achievement. I was very fortunate in the school I went to for my secondary education. It was there that I realized that my view of the world was not a normal one. Until the age of 10 or 11, this is what I saw. My vision was blurred. And for various reasons that would be a diversion or a distraction to go into now, my myopia or short-sightedness was not picked up. At least it did not receive the attention it should have. In case you don't wear glasses or you don't have experience of this, what you see on the screen is really quite bad. The strength of my current prescription is around minus seven. When you can't see the detail, when features, text, and colors all merge into one another in a haze, your capacity to connect with the world and learn from it is very much diminished. I remember my eye test and much more the day I got my first set of glasses. I don't know if uh, people in this room have watched you know, videos of people that are hearing for the first time when they get this ear implants, right? For me, in the space of a minute, my vision went from a blur to this. No. Where I was schooling was very close to nature, and I remember one of the thoughts that came to my mind as I walked out of the opticians was, so this is what green is. Focus. So the next slide. When used as a noun means the state or quality of having or producing clear visual definition. As a verb, focus means to adapt to the prevailing level of light and become able to see clearly. Physiological, physiologically, sorry, I became focused through using my glasses. But I was also what Yoruba people call an amebo. And getting glasses shot my curiosity off the scale, but in a good way. For example, I began to read. I read mainly works of vision, uh, fiction. And whilst many of my classmates were collecting stamps or shells and other inanimate objects, I had a little book in which I used to collect quotes. And you can see I, I still do. Focus helped me to pay attention to things. And focus helped me to learn how to hold my attention and later on how to hold the attention of others. The next thing I want to talk about is discernment. And discernment is defined as the ability to judge well. Let me explain the importance, at least of, in my life, of this discernment with a story. This happened when I was about 14 or 15 when I was deciding on the subjects I would study for my GCSEs, which are like O-levels or whatever examination you do at that point. The subjects you pick influence the course you study at university or whichever institution of higher education you end up going to. And then that ultimately determines your career in life. So I remember sitting with my father and putting forward my argument about my choice of subjects. I let him know that I intended to pursue a career as a graphic designer and that art school was as plausible an option for me as attending a university. I don't know if anybody else here has had a conversation with someone and at the end left saying to themselves, that, that went well, that went very well. <laughs> you see, nothing in my father's demeanor betrayed his disagreement with my well thought out argument. No word he spoke revealed his expectation that I would study to be, that he expected me to study to be a chemical engineer. So I'm not sure if his decision was inspired by the Umaru Diko affair of the early 1980s, but the location of my studies changed from wherever I was to Ibado. <laughs> the transfer affected my focus. My jam results were mediocre. I ended up studying botany as my first degree. There is so much to learn from this episode, but for me, it is a lasting lesson on the need to develop a higher level of judgment. And I hope I have not made light of what is a life-defining defining quality. To focus and discernment, I would like to add persistence. 
Persistence, according to the dictionary, is a firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. My next slide, this one, this one, yes, um, shows a picture taken on Mount Kilimanjaro, and that's in Tanzania. A friend of mine who I am incredibly proud of has just returned from climbing it, and this is one of the pictures that she took whilst above the cloud line. She climbed the mountain to raise money for the charity she believes in. She's Nigerian. <laughs> and over the phone yesterday, she shared some key lessons with me. I had actually prepared another example for persistence, but you need to listen to what she said. I've not included her picture because I want you to imagine what she looks like by what she told me. She said that after they reached one of the peaks, so they got as far as uh, a peak called Stella Point. She said, after they reached one of the peaks, one of the guides accompanying them told her that on the day they arrived, all of the guides, apart from one, believed that she wouldn't complete the climb. You make the climb as a group. And every day they were on that mountain, my friend will get to the point where they were to stop for the day for at times five hours after the rest of the group. They would start walking at 7.30 in the morning and she would finish her trek at about 7.30 in the evening. She then had to eat and get some sleep but wake up early enough to be ready to start walking again at 7.30 a.m. She did this for three to four days. On the last day, they started out at one in the morning she reached Stella Point at 1 p.m. They spent some time taking pictures and resting, and then they had to go back down to the camp where they would spend the night. She got there at 10 p.m. So on that last day, she started walking at 1 a.m., and she stopped walking after a short break at 10 p.m. According to her, her persistence and self-determination shocked even her. But that's not all. Persistence in itself is important, but also important are the things that it would lead to. Remember that I said all the guides, apart from one, did not believe she would complete the climb. The one that did believe stuck with her through the most difficult times. He encouraged and supported her physically and mentally. There were times she was leaning on him, but she was walking. She told me the greatest lesson she learned from her persistence was his patience. She was walking much too slowly, and yet he was so, so patient. To her now, it is unbelievable that she would be impatient with anyone after someone else has shown such immeasurable patience with her. So these are three things I have been working on developing in preparation for my own ideal opportunity. If I had more time, <laughs> to prepare this session, I would have added two more. I would have added humility. And the way the world we currently live in has perverted its meaning such that we have missed out on its power. I would also add courage. The president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson uh, Sirleaf, is quoted as saying, if your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. How many times when figures in the Bible are confronted with their own ideal opportunities, does God speak courage and strength to their hearts? Be strong, take courage, fear not. To be sure, there are many other qualities that can be added to this list. One is consistency. In the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 4, it is written that because the other governors of his day were jealous of Daniel and wanted to find a way to prevent King Darius from putting him in charge of the whole of his realm, they sought to find some charge against him concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. I think it is safe to stop here. I hope that these three focus discernment, and persistence are enough to start a discussion amongst us now, and then we can, we can add to it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm 
done. Yeah. Okay, so I stay. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, let me let me first of all say to you that um, when when someone stands here and ministers differently from me, it can be a challenge for some people. Uh, I think it was some years back. It was it was when we were in Kaduna at the beginning of the year. I taught the church on crafted prayer. Yeah. And the idea was that you could write a prayer that you will pray the entire year. And you literally will wake up in the morning and read that prayer. And it will be as anointed as a prayer that you prayed at the spur of the moment by inspiration. You know, just reading the scripture itself is inspiring and is anointed. I love your approach. I think I need to learn it. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes I think I over talk. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm serious. Straight to the point. I need this. No, seriously, I, I, need, I need to spend time reading this. The reason why I can ask you to go is that you're going to be a part of this dialogue. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe I will start from you and ask how life, I mean, we're, we're, we can still go back to this, but how did you get to this point? How, how did you? I, I, I love the, the fact, you know, that you shared, you know, something you spoke about in the beginning was that you didn't start off as a top student. And that's my story too. Um, if you know the kind of grades I've gotten. No, I can tell you this, that when I was in primary school, I was top one, two. It was either first or second. But something happened to me when I got into secondary school. <laughs> By the time I was in secondary school, I think all my years, right up to from five, in a class of about 28, I'll be about 20, 21, sometimes 24th position, never the last. <laughs> At least I tried. <laughs> but you know, when I look at myself today, um, I just, you, sometimes I still ask the question, what happened to me in seconds? Because it's, even my parents can't understand it. Here you are, an A student, and it started in class six, actually, of primary school. I just went from first, second to 20 something. I mean, I almost thought I was jazzed. But if that's jazz, it's good jazz. <laughs> So what's, I mean, what's been your own experience? You've, you've had opportunities. I know there's an opportunity knocking on your door, even right now. Um, so how, how did that happen? You know, how, how, was, how did that work out for you? So without sounding spiritual. <laughs> so I'll say the, 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 the preparation that I myself did, but of course it's also grace. Um, I tell people, if you want to do a PhD, you don't have to be smart. You just have to be persistent. Because you are reading, you know, in, it, it, there's a formula to it. You start off with a topic. You find out what people have said about it before. Then you find your question. You develop your research instrument. You go to the field. You collect it. So there is, and I should just add that uh, my first real job I was a consultant with Anderson Consulting, and I was a business process consultant. Anderson Consulting believes that so long as you have a 2-1, you can have that 2-1 in food technology. We don't care. They will teach you. So you, you just have to be teachable and persistent. So in whatever you do, just be persistent. Just keep working on it. Don't give up. Keep walking like, like my friend was. That said, my um, 
PhD was in the Department of Operations Research or Management Science. So I was with people that are brilliant. Look, when they say genius, <laughs> they see patterns in numbers. <laughs> you know, it's like witchcraft, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. They were, I mean, there was this girl, she's Greek. She was just amazing. So, so I, I don't want to um, belittle natural intelligence. It does so exist. So if you must, I mean, the principle is if you must be wise, yes. then you're going to need to work with wise men. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So for me, it was just work. And I, I can share another thing about myself, which I don't like doing, is that um, I, I also lecture. So I also used to lecture. So up until my appointment with the minister, I was uh, lecturing in Johannesburg. And before that, I lectured in Scotland and also in Manchester. And people have different styles of learning. They do. We don't all learn in the same way. And I'll give you an example. If I am presented with figures, I'm not good at maths, so that I even did statistics is a miracle. But when I see figures, I read them as text. And then I understand the formula. And then I understand it. So it also takes me longer to, to um, comprehend text. But when it comes to... English, um, very solid. <laughs> yes. yeah. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. you know, when, when we see successful people, we think that they've had it smooth right through life. And, and we fail to realize that they can be dyslexic mm. in particular parts of their lives mm -hmm. because, I mean, you're saying you're not a great math student but yet you studied math statistics. I hated math, I mean, statistics right through. I, I just never liked it. But my mom taught me numbers from counting money. <laughs> <laughs> so I know how, <laughs> I'm not that bad with numbers, but I'm bad with statistics. It works. It, it, it works. You know, that for me is a massive encouragement um, because being perfect in every area is not really found in anyone. It's boring. You know, you, you find that there are areas where you have strengths and there are areas where you have weaknesses, but it's all it's about persistence as well, that even though you may not learn easily, you can still learn. I, I have a friend... Um, we, when we went, we went School of Basic Studies in Zaria um, together, and I, I won't call his name to just keep it private, this guy used to go out to drink with myself and my friends. You know, we, we were a company, we used to go to drink. I mean, the night before exams, he comes back like that. And when he's going to sleep, he says, Shola, because we, we, our rooms are closed wake me at three to read. And so I felt advanta advantage because I was never drunk. So I'll be studying and I'll be saying to myself, this guy, he's going to fail. <laughs> if you know the grading of A levels, it's A, B, C, D, and E. He came out with A, A, B. <laughs> now, I'll go wake him up. And he'll be still too drunk to read. A, A, B. I read. <laughs> and I tried. <laughs> Do you know what I scored? D, E, F. <laughs> scored deaf. That was in 1982. This is 2015. Do you know that I have not seen those advantages really bring him to that significant point? 
But I've seen my disadvantages in spite of my disadvantages. I've seen myself move through a lot of work, through a lot of persistence. I've seen myself come to points where clearly I surpass him. And you know, it's the idea that some people are just naturally gifted. But others do not see themselves as being naturally gifted and would need to work out their gift. So whether you're naturally gifted or you work out your gift, you are not excluded from opportunities in God. And I, I, I mean, that's, that's what I see, that you can take that away and stop comparing yourself with somebody else because some people are just, it's as if when God gave them a brain, he did over time. And then he gave some of us like half. Do, do you get what I'm saying? And so you're going to need to put in extra effort to become. But many times those who seem not to even need the extra effort do not make a headway in life because that um, need to work and to, to drive themselves just doesn't, you know, come easy. I mean, just doesn't seem needful for them. You know, so uh, that's, that's taken quite something from, from what you've said. L let me, you, you said something very powerful about Joseph. I mean, I, I think I'm going to teach from it sometime. Joseph served. <clears throat> Pharaoh, Potiphar, the keeper of the prison, trusted. God blessed. This for me is the equation to take advantage of the ideal opportunity. Powerful. But watch this. You see that? That bridge that needs, that you need to cross over is the bridge of trust. That's, that's, that's the missing link. Can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? The whole world is looking for trusted men and women. The Bible says faithful men have disappeared from the face of the earth. A faithful man who can find. It's about that element of trust. You can't discount service because Joseph served. But you see, you can serve without being trusted. And then the blessing of God seems to delay. But he tr served and those he served trusted. So say to your neighbor, serve to be trusted. That's, that's powerful. Serve to be trusted. And you see, God bless. Now, are there any questions that you'd want to ask? When are you starting a new job? Okay, so we had a meeting yesterday on the phone. I actually start uh, 21st of September. And I can share about that as well. It was amazing. She's, 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 amazing. she's moving on to work with the Bill Gates Foundation. Yeah. It's powerful. So share about it. I mean... Oh, no. I wanted to share about the start date. <laughs> oh, the start date. Because I, I thought I would need to, to start much earlier. I thought I would need to start next month. And in all of this, they have been so supportive. I got the offer in January... It took me until after Easter to decide, and they were always so patient. So I told them, okay, I've wasted a lot of time. I need to start immediately. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you know. When you start, it's going to be 110%. We think, you know, you should take your time, pack up. You should go on holiday. You should. <laughs> and I'm like, I should. I should. <laughs> so they've given me a lot more time and they're just so gracious about it it's 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 humbling i think yeah. as i said 
collect her complimentary card, even though it will soon change. <laughs> and numbers will change. Okay, so who has questions for Abiodun? Oh, Abby. Good evening. Uh, very interesting and enlightening uh, topic. I, I want to ask this question, and I will say a little bit of my own experience too, like Pastor shared. Um, the topic is preparing yourself for the ideal opportunity. I also made a talk class. I made a talk class in the university, and I remember that um, before going to the university, my dad had a lot of hopes in me because I was from primary to secondary. Secondary, I was a bit uh, at least above average, and people considered me that. And for me, um, one of my biggest challenge really has to do with my children. Like my dad, I can see the, um, the giftings sort of in my kids, but I've made mistakes in my life, several mistakes. And one of those mistakes I think I, make, I made that I want to ask you, I want to find out if there's a way around it. As a lecturer, you've lectured in some schools around the world. I have these feelings. I made a talk class, not because I wasn't brilliant, but because I was more of a truant in the university. If you want to talk about the first 10 gamblers in school, I was one of them, but I was very brilliant. I never made an F. The worst I made was a receipt, and that was my final year. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm trying to get something across. Now, I will go to the gambling hall, gambling room, and from there, I go into exam halls. And at the end of the day, I come out with either a B or, at worst, a C. So I was scoring average because I wasn't reading, but I understood the topics. Now, the problem here is I found out that my relationship or my relationships with my lecturers was nil because of my social or antisocial life, so to speak. They did not know me. I went to Ife, by the way, and if some of the classes, I read economics, some of the classes were large, and in the halls, you have something like an ampit theater. I never sat in front or in the middle, always sitting at the back. So the lecturers did not know me. I have these strong feelings that one of the reasons why I kept scoring B's and C's were not because I failed the topics per se, but because I did not make myself available for some of my lecturers to know. Because when they know you and they see your script, well, I've, I've come to the point of marking scripts now. And sometimes you will just wonder, who wrote this? You don't know him. And all you could give is maybe an average score as compared to somebody that you know that you can relate with. So for once, I've been asking my, I've been telling my kids now that at every given opportunity, they should ask questions. <laughs> at every given opportunity, they should know their lecturers, even go to their houses, play with them, play with their children. And before you know what is happening, they will be scoring A's because sincerely speaking, <laughs> No, 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 I don't have girls. He said, what if they are girls? I don't have girls, I have boys. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have boys. So for me, um, is, it, is it the right approach, so to speak? Because, see, if you don't make yourself available, opportunities can pass you by. Opportunities to have good grades, to come out with a first class or a second class upper in the university. And thank you very much. So, um, very quickly, I, I don't have experience teaching in Nigeria, but I have experience studying in Nigeria. And because I studied botany, you know, in your first year, Jambai year, you're huge. But by the time you're in your third, fourth year, the class sizes are small. 
You know, there's a part in the Bible that says, you know, a man plans his way, but God guides his steps, right? So the botany, I'm a bit ashamed. Well, I used to be, but I'm not anymore. But one thing that happened in year three, again, to show you how unserious I am, in year three was when I knew that you leave university with something. I just thought, okay, we'll go to university, we do exams, we leave. I didn't know two, one, two, two, third class. It was in year three. And it, also, I think because, maybe because I was short-sighted, I, I, I'm, I'm not that engaged. I can check out whilst, you know, I can be walking in and not see the people around me. I do it, so you'll bear with me in church <laughs> about that. So in year three, our lecturers sat all of us in Botany down, and they explained the class and grade system. Now, you can explain that to your children, or they could be fortunate and have lecturers like that. Not only did they explain the, the class system, they had worked out our GPAs, and they had also worked out who could make a first, who could make two one, who could make two two, who could make third, who, who would make a third class. And from that point, they started working with us. When I was doing my, because I was borderline between 2-1 and 2-2, when I was doing my thesis, I knew who my supervisor was going to be in year three, Professor Mrs. Mabadije. I did not work in the lab. I worked in her own personal lab in her office because I would be distracted. So we had people that took an interest in us. So your children can be in a lecture theater, and just by the level of their interaction, the lecturer will notice them. They don't need to go to the, to the lecturer's house. If they have a question, seek out the lecturer. Um, I, I don't know about here, but where, where I was, you had to set time aside for student contact, and so they would come. And what that does, sorry, I'm taking very long. What that does is, when someone comes to meet me and they ask a question, we invariably talk outside of that question. And um, I, I believe in a liberal arts kind of education where, yes, you can go and study engineering and do the maths, but if you study engineering and you're also reading a book of, on literature, you will get things from it, and your understanding and the application will be broader. So encourage your children, yes, to seek out lecturers, but not just on a social visit. If there is a, that kind of lecture, I, well, I don't know. But it's more the level of interaction in the lecture theater, and when they have questions, to actually go and ask and get clarification, I, I think works better, yes. Sorry. Great. Lo lovely answer. Le let me ask this question. You, you had your first degree in botany. Yes. So how did you migrate out of botany? I mean, because um, that's, that's a major um, career change. So I finished botany. I went for my youth service. When I finished botany, I was actually okay with it because my dissertation was looking at, um, there's a chewing stick called Omiata. Um, uh, I, I forget its, its name, and it has uh, astringent properties. I used to marvel at my grandfather. You know, and this is another thing, being curious about things and exploring that curiosity. So I used to marvel that this man doesn't use toothpaste and toothbrush yet. He's not feeling this toothache and he still has most of his teeth. So I did um, uh, research on the plant organisms that you know could be found in the infusion. So when I finished, I was actually interested in pursuing it. But Mr. Jagun had other plans. He was like, you'll just be a professional gardener. You know, there's no future in this. So again, favor, faith, you know, fortune. <laughs> I have a father that believes he has five girls and one boy, and we're all very educated. So when I finished my, my youth service, I went for a master's and MBA. When I finished that, I came back and I did, um, I, I started working in Anderson Consulting. That said, I have two masters. My second master was paid for. It was a scholarship. 
at the time when I was applying, people were like, do you know somebody? It's British Chevening, you know, if you don't know anybody. And I put in the application. I went for the interview and I got it and I left. And the second one was really what began, began to open doors. Because whilst I was doing that, and you know, if, 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 ah, God is good. <laughs> I'm sorry. God is really good. Because at the end of my first semester of my MSc in operations research, the head of, God will always bring people to you. He, he, he really will. My head of department called me and said, if you could do a PhD, would you? He was the one, I, I did a PhD as an international student, funded. And what tends to happen, even as a home student, is that they tell you what to study. I was so fortunate that I could pick any topic to study. I studied something that I just thought was, oh well, interesting. By the time I finished, the whole world was talking about what I studied. And Pastor, I'll just say this last thing and then I'll keep quiet. One thing I learned doing the PhD, as well as pers persistence, is rema. <laughs> there's such rema. There's such a thing as knowledge that is revealed. You will go out, you will do the interview, you will collect the data, then you will stare at that page. You will stare at your screen. You will do different computations. I don't care what you studied. And I've spoken to many other people that have done PhDs. And then one day will come. You will just see it. It will just make sense. And then you will write it down, and then you will tell other people, and they'll be like, yeah, of course. But they didn't know it until you told them. I, I, don't, I don't believe that is, um, it's, not, it's not, yeah, it's revealed, you know. So I'll just stop there. But there's so, yeah, I'll just stop there. You know, <laughs> Job, powerful, Job says, um, there's a, Job 38, 32, there's a spirit in man. The inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding and and that's connected to rema when peter said you are the christ the son of the living god jesus said flesh and blood did not reveal this to you and you see that dimension is important for us it's it's that input that makes the difference but many times we become so locked down to our intellect that we shut out rema completely um when I was in, in, in university, just to show you how much I lagged behind, um, for my first degree and second degree thesis um, in architecture, the, the students will be asked to pick their thesis subject and they would submit it. By the time everybody submits, I'm left out. But here am I in church worshiping God and suddenly it enters my heart. Now, I am three weeks behind my classmates. Then I go to my, <laughs> you know, my, my um, it, what's the word now? Supervisor. Supervisor. And I say this is my topic, and at this point, they're expecting drawings. I'm just coming with topics. And that happened for my first degree and second degree, but you know, on the day of my presentation, I was in control of the environment. Now, the average student would have 20 sheets of drawing. I mean, you're talking about A0 size. So if you think of A4, A, A, A3, A1, A0, that's the size. They would have like 20 on the wall. I would have like 43, sometimes 50. I think for my master's, I had 50. When I stepped into the invigilation into the supervision with external examiners for my masters, my supervising or my supervisor said, behold the magician. <laughs> and you know, because the subjects came by inspiration, I ended up lecturing the external examiner about what I was doing. So it, it was 
it was difficult for them to punch holes because they don't they're looking at it <laughs> and they don't know what it is now when pastor esther was here that was my master's thesis what dropped in my heart was to do a christian recreation center the idea that the spiritual and the natural have a meeting place now the site i chose ended up becoming the site they would own you know the spiritual impact of that and, and follow this it came by inspiration i god gave me the i mean the idea i located the site in joss and spiritually you remember when god said to abraham walk this land i took that land spiritually and nobody could buy it until they came and bought the land and i never knew them for the sake of the gospel and then you, we realized that we have the same spiritual same purpose same spiritual heritage same spiritual father linking us together that's how god does things so the place of inspiration you 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 be you 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 if, if you've got a business you're going to go into your business place one day and you're just going to be staring at what you've known then suddenly you 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 get that revelation you get that rema that comes from heaven and say yeah that's 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 it looking at the things you've been you know your your typical setup it then comes to you and and that's how we gain the advantage over those who do not have the spirit of god in them okay any other, I mean, any, any questions? Let's, yeah. Sambo. Good evening, Abby. Um, I have two questions, and it's based on focus. Where you are now, you said you've studied, you have two masters, you have a PhD. Are they all linked? to where you are now? Is, did you see it right from then? Or you had to keep refocusing as you changed the power of your lenses? Yeah. I don't know if you understand. Okay, then secondly, um, I work with young people, teenagers, and I have discovered that they learn differently. We were very focused, you study linear. <laughs> One thing, one line, you know, we study one thing at a time. But they seem to be mosaic learners. There's reading, listening to music, on Facebook, the TV screen is on, and they're chatting. Teenagers, are we together? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, uh, could you put focus in that context today? How are young people supposed to learn? How are they going to get educated if this is the way they're learning? Should we change our style of teaching? Oh, sorry, I'm old school. Okay. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you. I actually, when, when, when I said I had uh, an example for persistence, and then I spoke with my friend Shola, and I changed the example, it was actually to do with learning. Um, when I was young, I, I was a daydreamer. Hi, <laughs> I will check out. <laughs> I'll, be like, I'll be somewhere else. I used to wonder, you know. So that slide, actually, before I changed it, was wondering, that's W-A-N-D-E-R, versus wondering, W-O-N-D-E-R. You, you know, um, there is a study that's going on in the university, um, University College London, King's College, where this researcher is studying the way in which the human brain is developing in children because it's a digital world. And already they're finding, you know, it's amazing. The, the body really is amazing. They're already finding changes in, you know, retention, uh, um, being able to pay attention, you know, and, and things like that, that are uh, being caused by this um, um, 
exposure, intense exposure to technology and digital technology. I still believe that if we go back to those principles of focus, of diligence, of persistence, it's something, it's a shame because it's going to be really difficult for kids growing up now. They have to work extra hard. I don't, I don't have children, but Omar will tell you, I have a nephew and he's my firstborn. <laughs> he really is. And I gave her this book because I've been, I've been struggling with how to relate to a 17 year old and not break his spirit, you know. And I'm reading this book, it's called Bringing Up Boys. And for the first time, I'm learning that there are physiological differences between men and women that affect the way men communicate, boys communicate. So now when we're talking, I'm a lot more patient and I'm trying to understand where he is coming from. At the same time, telling him, you can't continue to write text messages in abbreviation. It, the world is not going to change to allow that. And they do it amongst themselves. And before you know it, it's creeping into business language. And, you know, my, my nephew and I, when we, we talk or we discuss, we've had a discussion about how he believes in two generations' time, Jobalain in Yoruba culture will be done away with. I said, God forbid, they will not. <laughs> so, so I think if you work with uh, children, and I'm putting in a plug for the Bible summer Bible club, <laughs> you, you need to really teach them that over and above what you were doing as a child, things are harder. You are a millionaire at 17. The pressure, you know, forget all the other social things. The pressure to excel and to be seen as excelling is, is terrible. You need to invest so much more time, not just in your kids, but in the kids around you. Get them to read. My nephew, when he was small, we used to do poetry to get, I hate poetry, but we will sit down, we will structure poetry together because you never know. And last one, then I'll, I'll keep quiet. My sister was talking to me about my nephew, he wanted to go for a party and she just wanted information. Whose party? Where are you going? Who is the supervising adult at 17? Who is the supervising adult and everything? So, you know, he was being lazy about it and then he got upset. You know, I don't get to go out. He calls me and I'm like, listen, this is all training. In a year's time, you're going to be in university. You can go for any party that you want. But our hope is as somebody is telling you about that party, you are already thinking, where is it? Is it safe? You know, all those things that your parents will be, will be thinking. The same way that we try and guide behavior socially, we really need to do it intellectually as well. We can't be lazy because we are also tired. We're also working really hard. We need to take an interest. If you see me reading my nephew's exam, uh, report card, even he will ask me, is everything okay? <laughs> I am studying it. You know, they say things like he has issues with integrity. I'm like, are you a liar? You know, but what they're even saying is different from integrity that we're, we're talking about. It's about being true to himself and pushing himself. So we need to, we need to engage. Or that he has, he has issues. He's not curious enough, you know, and, 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 I think for, for, for boys, that's a problem because you would go and you would say, how are you? Fine. As it, you are like, no, ask me how I am. Ask me what kind of day I've had. And, and you know, those kinds of conversations. So I think if you're working with teens, um, they are having to learn in a different environment, but the principles of learning, I don't believe should change. Yes. The first one <laughs> about uh, fo how my focus was changing, uh, that one, like I said, is that in your mind, you know where you want to go, and then God just directs your steps. So I didn't plan it, but uh, yeah. I look back, 
like Pastor said, uh, I look back and it, it's all just making sense. Yeah. Yes. When, when do you stop learning? You never. You know, I, I, we, 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 we have a church. Um, in every church, there are different groupings of people. Um, there are those who would hear you and you would say you've had the privilege of having Western education, so it's because of those advantages that you are where you are. And so people just shut their minds down and say, look, forget it. I, I schooled, I schooled in, um, in, in LEA primary school. No. Uh, there's a special place I like in the East. It is called Arondizuoku. <laughs> That's why I've never been there, but... Just the name is exciting. So forget it. All this is talk. It does not apply to me. Um, what would you say to them? Because, you know, you've, you've had a track within the academia. Is there a track for other people as well? Um, you know, who have not had the opportunity of being in the academia. Um, I'm surrounded by people when our... When, uh, um, we, we had a young lady who joined us in Kaduna many years ago and she, she joined the church to work with the church and um, she was just basically um, a very passionate person and she had an OND. Well, uh, it, it's interesting to know that over the last couple of years she's gone back to go upgrade herself um, not because she felt she was disadvantaged, but she just wanted to reposition herself to take advantage of opportunities that may come. So, whereas you have people who believe in the academia and may be pursuing and acquiring, you know, new skills and training and all of that, what about people who don't? What, what would you say to that? So that you can at least not just speak to those of us who assume we are smart, but people who might have shut up, you know, sh sh created a wall in their minds to say, look, uh, Abby, she's just, uh, she, she, she's just had unusual advantages and all that. So, two things. Um, and I really do believe when I prayed and asked God to suspend whatever prejudices we have that he heard. So, I'll say two things. And I'll start with the first. As Pastor was speaking, I was trying to come up with people in the Bible that were got to where they were because of the circumstances of their birth. So someone like Daniel, he was a prince, if we were to. But David was a shepherd boy, a forgotten shepherd boy. When, <laughs> when Samuel came, he was in the fields. So he wasn't, I, I'm trying to find an illustration for today. He was an agbero. Do, 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 do you understand? But God purposed in his, God had a purpose for him. And there was an ideal opportunity. And he became king. So that's the first one. And then the second one uh our stereotypes and our expectations of people that we believe um, are fortunate or have had um, a good start in life. When I went to school, aside from my two older sisters, I was the only black girl in that school. My first sister, she's five years older than me, and then the other one is eight years. So there was a time where I was the only black girl in that school. Uh, racism is true, and racism will make you doubt your self-worth. There was a period people would play with me, but they wouldn't touch me. And, you know, as a kid, how you process it is, is different. So even when we think, oh, that person is fortunate, 
yeah. <laughs> the circumstances are, are very different. And then there are many examples of people that apparently had everything but have amounted to nothing. It's, it's just the grace of God. But that's just by the way. What I say to people that believe because they haven't been exposed enough is that, um, uh, and I say it because um, I don't want to sound as though I don't understand what the, but I, re, I will just say it. God will expose you. You will be, if you are in his will, he would, he, I really believe he would direct your steps and you will accomplish that ideal opportunity he has created for you. Amen. You will, indeed. Thank you. Yes. My best friend, summer school is important. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I don't have kids <laughs> yet. Ah, the thing that has helped me the most in understanding where my nephew is right now, and I can't really share how <laughs> my heart breaks. And he's a good boy, but I am so fearful of what could happen to him. And the only thing that helps me rest, I fast and pray, is that word from God that says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is gone, he won't depart from it. That's the only thing that makes me sleep well at night. So I really just want to, in fact, I'm shameless, I want to beg for support for Lighthouse Church, Children's Church, the Summer Bible School. I know Omoa has lots of volunteers, but it's going to cost money. And we need money because whilst you could be doing your best to train up your child, society is made up of many other children that are growing up in a very difficult and dysfunctional society. So if you want to know how you can support, please see Pastor Omwa after the <laughs> okay Omwa after the service, and I I am definitely doing my part, and I I just pray that you know you all will see the need to do yours as well. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Is this for me? Oh, okay. Okay, I'd, I'd love to get, I mean, this needs to be read because it's, it's really very powerful. Can we appreciate Abby again for just, um, for this time out? How many of you learned something, at least one thing? 